black jockeys were part of Southern life. They were as Southern as grits. People saw that they were making lots of money and didn't like it. It's part of American history that we should know about and appreciate. Black riders dominated the sport early on. Shoemaker misjudges the finish line, stands up in the stirrups, and Iron Liege wins by a nose. Closest derby finish in 24 years. When you go back and you look at the first derbies, I mean, it was all about African-American jockeys. The uh, contribution of the African-American jockeys to the Kentucky Derby was ignored, overlooked. I think there are so many young black men who could be jockeys and would be jockeys if we throw away the politics and give them a chance. And I'm proud of these people because even by going through all these hardships, they were still able to achieve great things. Farms across the colonies were not just the breeding grounds for thoroughbred horses but also became the proving grounds for some of the nation's first athletes, African-American jockeys who were celebrated for years and over time saw their once bright stars slowly fade. Hello and welcome, I'm Steve Crump. Long before Joe Lewis, Jackie Robinson, Wilma Rudolph, and Michael Jordan all became household names, there was another group of athletes that opened the door and paved the way. In the 1700s, it was Austin Curtis. In the 1800s, Monkey Simon and Cato. And following the Civil War, a Kentucky Derby dynasty was born. By the 1900s, many of their efforts had diminished. But as we enter this new millennium, much of what they've done has been forgotten at the finish line. Exploding thunder and lightning. Go! Two horse! Eight horse! Go! Go! Horses finely tuned, genetically inspired, and charging to win. Thoroughbred racing is often an event of high society and big money. Hundreds of years ago, African-American jockeys ruled the sport of kings. But in today's times, their once popular faces have been reduced to fractions. They were the Michael Jordans of their day. They really created the appetite and the fervor for horse racing in the United States. Most people still don't know anything about these jockeys or that they ever existed, and uh, I, I, it's a terrible um, flaw in American history. It's an American history tragedy. I think it's really almost criminal that sports fans, particularly those fans who are interested in horse racing, don't know the significant role that African Americans played in really the, the, the formative days of the sport. Their accomplishments were such uh, so spectacular given their uh, conditions. Win is Hitty Edge, right on top, pick a win is. Win is Hitty Edge. There you go, the big card, the winning card to Daddy Edge. Try one today. Two dollars. Pony lovers and horse racing enthusiasts have been meeting at New York's historic Saratoga race course for over a century. It is one of the nation's oldest tracks for horse racing and home of the Herald of Traverse Stinks. Back in 1665, centuries before the opening of Saratoga, Long Island provided one of the first venues for American horse racing. New York and other colonial communities became an early showcase for black jockeys. It really started in the Revolutionary War, Virginia was the center of horse racing in the colonies. Uh, places like Baltimore and Charleston and uh, New Orleans were uh, very important centers for horse racing uh, throughout. They were national centers. The planters of the Old South are some of the richest people in the world. Therefore, they've got the economic resources. And also understand this, horse racing has always been an expression of European aristocracy. It was local, it was spontaneous. Uh, most of the horse racing in that period was what's known as quarter horse, which is basically a quarter of a mile, straight shot. Two horses, A and B, go however far, usually about a 
a quarter of a mile. It used to be you just got went out in front of the tavern, figured out what a quarter mile was, and you ran in a straight line. Well, over a period of time, that evolved into the circular or oval course so that you could enjoy the entire race. A very high human cost was attached to constructing those courses during the evolution of thoroughbred racing. Somebody had to build those things. Somebody had to maintain those. And the African-American population, the slave pro population, and the freed black population as a labor force were very significant in establishing the race courses. The first jockey club in America was organized in Charleston in 1734 by um, members of uh, Charleston's uh, planter elite. Uh, before even uh, the English Jockey Club. So it's, uh, it, Charleston in many ways is a pioneer uh, of horse racing in the South. There were presidents and vice presidents and schedules and records and champions. And it was really the first sport that you know, takes on the characteristics of what we would consider modern sports. So they are exclusive by design. I mean, they are meant to uh, uh, set up uh, rules, regulations, but also to um, ensure you know, the, uh, the uh, status of the uh, events, uh, to make sure that they are controlled by the planter elite. Uh, so they own the tracks, they bred the horses, uh, they made the rules. Uh, so uh, certainly it's their, uh, their means of controlling these uh, events. By controlling many of the elite functions, the founding hierarchy of these sporting organizations made it clear that the riders couldn't join for an obvious reason, the color of their skin. So the jockeys, of course, were, uh, were uh, slaves who belonged to the members of the jockey club, but no, the jockeys themselves certainly couldn't. At a time when papers carried publicized notices for runaway slaves, and Main Street businesses boldly sold highly skilled laborers, African Americans made another kind of news. On the pages of the Spirit of the Times Journal, prices of prize thoroughbreds were routinely listed. But look closely at the print in this 1853 edition. It reports a jockey by the name of Abe sold for the sum of $2,350. But in many places, the athletes were intentionally ignored. The documentation that has survived was written by the elite people, and um, they wrote about themselves, they wrote about the horses. Uh, there's very little mention of the people who actually rode the horses, so the documentation is, is very lacking, I'm afraid. We never had great record keeping. Baseball has statistics they can tell everything from the year one in baseball. So a lot of the people who are in the first part of, of racing, the digging up those statistics are a difficult project. The contribution of black jockeys have been vast and deep. I mean, we're talking about not just in, in the 1800s, but we're talking about when they used to have the famous quarter horse races. New York Times writer William C. Roden is among today's journalists searching and finding the missing people and places. Black jockeys were, we're talking about the late 1600s, 1700s, 1800s. You, you've had centuries of black jockeys because um, that's sort of what they did when, when people would have these uh, horses. Uh, the people who they had taken care of them were basically their slaves. Some contributions made by jockeys born as slaves have been unearthed. A runaway by the name of Sewell won the 1865 Travers Stakes. In the same race the following year, a freed Abe Hawkins of Louisiana tasted victory at Saratoga's finish line. Plantation owners sought out, you know, I mean, any slave who showed any propensity for horsemanship was immediately um, tagged for that position. The part of the history that strikes me as most poignant is some people would, some of the men would ride for their freedom. You know, they'd win enough so that they could buy their freedom from the people who gave them the horses to ride in the first place. Not everybody's going to walk up to a horse. And so these individuals had to be specialists. And they had to care about that animal. I mean, you can't just feed the animal. They had to bond with that animal. Maybe in the beginning, uh, put a little guy up on a horse just for fun, passing the time and eventually then would train him and they could see if he had 
what they call good hands and a good seat. Horse racing wasn't play. That was their job. That was their work. That was part of what they did. And I'm sure that they were looked upon and prized greatly by their slave owners because they're an economic income producer. He was also bringing in money because as he trained a horse, as he took care of a horse, as he rode a horse, and those bets were won that were placed on that horse, he was actually contributing to the overall value of the planter and the plantation. Certainly, um, slaves were, in fact, the, the prominent uh, primary riders in many of the races way before uh, racing became a well-organized sport. It's almost like it is today for some inner city kids. It's a way to get out. Uh, sports is that way to get to the top. I think that's the same way it was back in that particular day. Uh, you had slavery and you had nothing else. And they lived uh, in separate quarters and they ate better. So, you know, for them, they were living a, a much better life. This was an opportunity for people of color to have an opportunity to advance themselves. So it's a marriage of aristocracy, their money, the blended horse, and the African slave. The use of slave enslaved men with horses uh, continued well into the Civil War. If there was somebody who could get on a horse and ride it fast, win money, bring money, bring wealth to the owner, that's an asset. The sport also brought its share of liability. There are examples from race courses, including uh, the one here in Charleston, but throughout the South where, where planters bet uh, slaves at the races. You bet your property. You have to put up stuff to bet. And of course, you know, a lot of people might think, well, isn't that, isn't that awful that people put up human beings as prizes, in essence, collateral? Men bet their slaves. Men bet their houses, men bet their fortunes on a single horse race. You have to understand these people, they, they, just, they just did it because that's when they lived and what they did. I mean, they didn't think that much about it. But absolutely they'd bet slaves. Ten years after the death of slavery in America, a new and important era of sports gave birth on this very racetrack. Louisville's Jockey Club ushered in the inaugural Kentucky Derby at a place now called Churchill Downs. The first Kentucky Derby in 1875 had 10,000 spectators. It's a huge number of people. Um, I mean, they couldn't eat, you know, there were no roads, there were, people were walking. The 10,000 people who turned out for the first derby on May 17th of 1875 watched a race in which 13 of the 15 jockeys were black. The great thing about the Kentucky Derby is that uh, it's, it's the oldest sporting event, major sporting event in the country. It's been run over the same plot of ground every year since 1875, and I think uh, uh, you just cannot ignore the, uh, the contributions that they made in those early years. The first Saturday in May brings more than 100,000 race fans on average to see the annual Run for the Roses. Here is Churchill Downs, where they've been... While the famous, powerful, and trademark mint juleps are often showcased... And celebrities, yes, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor are among the headliners. And Steve Hannigan and Ann Sheridan join the merry throng. And Greer Garson and Senator Anderson, everybody's here and anybody can win. Horsemen taking to the turf have become celebrated figures in what's billed as the greatest two minutes in sports. Willie Hartack is aboard decidedly, but retired Eddie Arcaro has no mouth for the first time in many years as the crowd awaits the parade to the post. Black and white newsreels came decades after the early riders charged their way into the record books. The first derby was won by a black man. That ought to be one of those facts that who wants to be a millionaire ought to be asking that question for somebody to get $500,000. You know, most of the jockeys 
when the Kentucky Derby first started being run, most of the jockeys were African American. And, you know, somehow that, we didn't quite learn that when we were reading the, the history books when we were younger. Just found that out two years ago that the first uh, derby was won by an African American, and it's like it put a big smile on my face, you know. It, it gave me some more hope. Oliver Lewis demonstrated faith on board Aristides when he became the first man to win a Kentucky Derby. Like Lewis, a horse's trainer was also an African American. His name, Ansel Williamson. Over the next eight years, three other men of color found victory in the sport's most coveted event at Churchill Downs. But in 1884, one man would leave a permanent imprint that's still talked about today. Isaac Murphy, in his own way, paved the way for every little bit of, when it was time for somebody to come along and do something special, there's always a precedent. Murphy is basically the jockey, irrespective of race, creed, or color, He's the one who really elevated, represents sort of the final elevation of the status of the jockey. Isaac Burns Murphy was born in Lexington, right in the middle of Kentucky's bluegrass region. The son of free parents, Ike Murphy as he was known, won three Kentucky Derbies, the first man ever to do so. His initial win came in 1884 on a horse named Buchanan, a colt that had previously tossed him out of the saddle. Six years later, he achieved another notable feat by bringing Riley across the wire in what press accounts called a solid victory. And again, during 1891, Murphy won the Kentucky Derby on Kingman. That was the first time any jockey had won the event in back-to-back -back attempts. He had a tremendous personality he was beautifully educated. To say that he was a gentleman in all circumstances would, if anything, be an understatement. Clearly, Isaac Murphy was a man of many records. Here he is on board Salvatore in a well-publicized match race, defeating a horse by the name of Tenney back in 1890. Murphy's Derby accomplishments of three wins stood for decades. Earl Sandy tied it in 1930. But over time, a legendary rider and superior horse shattered a record that lasted for 58 years. Citation wins this derby just as he pleases, his ears pricking, our Carroll smiling to himself, and Citation is home the winner by three and a half lengths. Eddie R. Carroll picked up a fourth garland of roses after guiding Citation across the wire in 1948. Beyond his many triumphs, Murphy's impressive record is still regarded among the best by winning 44% of his mounts. Out of 1,412 races, the rider referred to as the Colored Archer came home first 628 times. He was always known for giving his best effort, and sometimes, uh, unfortunately, jockeys haven't always done that, but he was known as a man, I think, of, uh, of great integrity. He had that reputation. People always knew that they could count on his strict honesty. His principles, life, and performances are examined in the book, Isaac Murphy, Kentucky's Record Jockey, written by Betty Borries. He was a very high caliber gentleman, strictly honest, and among other things, was, was known for never breaking a promise. While Murphy was comfortable in various social settings off the track, like this clam bake in New York, by contrast, he overcame life-challenging experiences while on horseback. With Murphy, um, he, he, there were lots of reports that his horses were drugged. So, uh, you know, so there were all, all kinds of things that were going on to, um, to sabotage black jockeys. There's a story where white riders ganged up against another white rider to push him off a horse. And Murphy, who's riding alongside him, 
literally keeps that man in the saddle and saves his life. At the peak of his success, Isaac Murphy was one of America's highest paid athletes. That was during a period when big dollar signing bonuses or product endorsements for sports stars were not yet heard of. He sort of pulled the entire profession up in terms of the, the esteem, the stature of the profession. Um, from Murphy on, uh, jockeys started making lots of money. He won 35 of 75 races in 1879. Now we're talking 1879, and he began making $10,000 to $20,000 a year, which is astronomical for those times. And Murphy uh, was a very stylish guy. Was very, he, he, had a, he had a valet that traveled around with him. Success turned to sorrow. By the end of his career, Isaac Murphy took on a personal demon that was professionally damaging, the problem of weight. We don't know exactly the date that that photograph was taken, but you can get an idea of this problem that he was having with his weight. The problem with his weight seemed to have resulted in some habits, uh, weight-reducing habits that ultimately uh, proved to be rather disastrous to his health. And so towards the end of his career, he was constantly struggling to uh, maintain both a healthy uh, profile as well as to stay within the weight limits. When the funeral announcements came in 1896, many said and reported that he lost a battle to pneumonia. Isaac Murphy was 36 years old. He was survived by a wife. They had no children. While the Derby can bring out the unusual. Fur ties and diamond studded teeth are part and parcel of the big doings. But they're serious business too. History has demonstrated that this event is responsible for some of America's earliest sports records. Two unmatched milestones happen in the big race during the same decade as Isaac Murphy's last Kentucky Derby win. Lonnie Clayton came home first in 1892 on Osra and a well-known colt called Helma, regarded as the king of his class, helped Sue Perkins do the same thing three years later. Both captured horse racing's most famous event at age 15. When you're 15 years old, you don't know fear. It's a stat because we don't feel that it will ever be uh, broken. When you look at it 15 years old, you're not allowed to ride in, the, in racing here in America. Uh, so those stats, those records, are in place from here to eternity. Eleven individual jockeys um, won 15 of the 28 derbies, with three of those uh, jockeys being uh, winning winners two or more times. They won all kinds of stakes races. It wasn't just the Kentucky Derby. Strong performances were also turned in at Pimlico, Maryland, home of the Preakness. Racing enthusiasts show up here in mass. Get your front row box seats here, guys. Who got them at the finish line? Front row. But the track isn't the only place for celebrations. In the shadows of Pimlico Racecourse, activities on nearby streets contribute to an upbeat neighborhood sideshow. Horse racing, second jewel of the Triple Crown, shares similarities with the Kentucky Derby. In the clubhouse dining room are the images of those who helped set the standard for many of today's riders, Isaac Murphy and Willie Sims. Sims is the only African-American jockey to win each of the Triple Crown events. He found victory in the Derby, Preakness, and Belmont Stakes, all between 1894 and 1898. His talents weren't regionally based. He was a known writer throughout America, and uh, thus it allowed him to go on and win the Preakness as well as the Belmont. All right, let's see what we got here. We got the 405 and 350. 755 is that? 755. Is that right? New York's Belmont Park provides the final stage and last jewel for horse racing's Triple Crown. Coming down the stretch is a shared experience for those choosing to saddle up. 
Racing simulators are part of the industry's Go Baby Go campaign. Long before high school bands, electric tote boards, and free spending crowns, black jockeys made lasting contributions in the oldest triple crown event that started in 1864. Cold rain and wind. That's the weather picture at Belmont Park on Long Island for the nearly 100 years before native dancer galloped to glory. Ed Dudley Brown was one of three African Americans to find victory in the Belmont. He came home first in 1870 on Kingfisher. But seven years later, he would claim another milestone by training Derby winner Baden Baden. In the saddle on Brown's horse on May 22nd of 1877 was jockey William Walker. When you look at their records and their winning percentages, I mean, it's really pretty fantastic. And yet, uh, for whatever reason, they've, they've been uh, kind of ignored through the years. While bold headlines showcased the accomplishments, fine print once again told the truth about society's reality. Kirk's Guide to Racing in the late 19th century published the names of jockeys, but notice the asterisk. They were placed here to denote the color of one's skin. Sporadic attention came during their heyday of dominance and prominence, and at a time when other well-known individuals of the sport like Jimmy Lee and Tony Hamilton shined. He won his first race when he was 17 and by 1901 had ridden 161 winners. New York writer Joe Cavallo comes back to the words she once penned about jockey Jimmy Winkfield. She wrote them for an article in American Legacy magazine titled, Day of the Black Jockey. From the time he was young, just a young child, four years old, he just always loved horses. There was just something, he just had that gift. But in the formative years, the combination of talent and unbridled ambition nearly ended his career. He gets in trouble. One of the first times he ever rides, and literally is suspended from racing. Fifteen Negroes rode to Derby fame. There were fifteen black jockeys that won up to that point. My father was the last one, fifteen, to win the Derby. Lillian Casey was and, part of uh, Winkfield's that, rich life. No longer, she knew no him, riding. loved him, and protects the family's legacy. Wow. Many of the untold stories and exposure came right from her father. All he wanted to do was to ride the horses. And to become a jockey was uh, more or less a discovery that one of the uh, stable boys saw him ride and said and told uh, one of the trainers, you know, we should get him because he's good. And so they took my father, you know, and put him on a horse and sure enough. She was born two decades after her dad found first place in the Kentucky Derby during the early 20th century and as the only known living daughter of a Derby winner. They called him Wink. And to this date, the last African-American rider to win the Run for the Rose is in the 1900s. Like Isaac Murphy, the Derby victories came in back-to-back -back efforts. First, in 1901 on his eminence, and the following year he found the finish line on Alan Adale. Wolf is another, is another sort of law story. It's a really a great story. It's an incredible story, extending beyond American shores, from the racetracks of Russia to the conflicts of World War II. A story inspiring today's scarce black jockeys like James Long. My hero always was Jimmy Winkfield, because Jimmy, he, Mr. Winkfield, went through the struggles of it and when he couldn't take the racial tension he went to Europe and Russia and rode races for the Tsar and say, oh, sing, almost single-handedly saved racing over in Europe before he went back to Paris. He rode for the Tsar, he rode for counts, he rode for nobility and as well as others and he rode well, he won many races. It was Russian Tsar Nicholas II, pictured here reviewing his troops, who helped Winkfield become a star in a foreign land. I think he was free to do whatever he wanted. The minute he landed uh, in Russia, he was taken in. Um, he was given the best horses to, to ride. <clears throat> um, and he rode all over 
uh, Europe. Racing in Europe gave Wink a fresh start. It was something he pursued after a disappointing second place finish in the 1903 Kentucky Derby. Legend has it that he went to Russia after a disagreement with powerful horse owner John E. Madden. But his daughter shares a different version. He was threatened, but... Uh, Who made the threats? I think it was the Ku Klux Klan, from what my father says, but you never knew exactly who it was. Tracks all over Europe opened a new world for Winkfield until the winds of war began blowing. He raced in Germany and in Poland and won all the major races there. Um, he he was, had quite a reputation and continued um, to, to race until uh, the Bolsheviks came and closed, started to close all the tracks. The Bolshevik Revolution scattered tens of thousands from their homes. It meant that Winkfield and his future wife, Lydia Demikovitz, would have to find a new place to live. He went to France, and he, and he, he, he built a stable of horses you know, that he trained. Winkfield settled in Maison Lafitte near Paris. That's where he successfully trained horses with his son Robert here on the right. But another global conflict would uproot this former Kentucky Derby winner and his family. Hitler's massive occupation of France brought a new set of circumstances. German troops took over Paris and the nearby town Winkfield called home. He had a true love for the animal itself. And it showed when he almost got killed in France when the German came to the, our home and they were putting five horses to one stall that was made for just one horse. And when they wouldn't go in, they would beat the horse. And my father went up there with a pitchfork. And he was going to harm this German soldier, you know, who was forcing those horses in the stall. And he said, you hurt those animals, he said, I'll kill you. As the Axis powers tightened their stronghold, Jimmy Winkfield and his family were forced to start over yet again. Dodging the Germans meant escaping to the States, where daughter Lillian says, his once bright star had dimmed. He was at the top and at the very bottom, both. Uh, the top was when he was in France doing well. WPA workers have constructed a huge swimming pool and are now completing... The bottom came back in the U.S. as the federal government recruited thousands of African-American laborers into the Works Progress Administration. One of them taking the offer was Jimmy Winkfield. He had a hard time and it was difficult for him because he had never done uh, what you call real manual labor. Completing government improvement projects provided a steady income, but he missed the horses and longed for the track. In time, Jimmy Winkfield returned to his first love, rebounding as a trainer and owner. His efforts are remembered by longtime staffers at Pimlico Racecourse. He trained horses around here on the Maryland Circuit in Delaware Park, and uh, uh, I got to know him pretty well. And uh, he, he was the nicest kind of person you ever want to run into. And not only that, sometimes he'd give you a winner. By the 1950s, Winkfield moved again, this time on his own choosing, back to Maison Lafitte. But there would be a final sojourn to his bluegrass racing roots. Pageantry has always loomed large at Kentucky Derbies, as newsreel photographers captured colorful storylines. One historic angle got past the film cameras in 1961, the return of Wink. Jimmy Winkfield came back to the Downs exactly 60 years after first winning the big race here. My father was quite happy. That was his first time to go back to a derby. The recognition of success also brought its moments of bitterness. Louisville's renowned Brown Hotel hosted a derby gathering sponsored by Sports Illustrated. But tensions flared when some of the special invited guests had problems getting in. We were invited to the Brown's Hotel and we were refused at the door. But finally, after I explained, you know, what, why we were there, 
Finally, they let us in. They sent somebody, somebody came down and talked to us to come in. The social slight came during a period when aggressive demands were being put on a nation. Shortly after, Jimmy Winkfield returned to French soil. No longer did he have to feel threatened by those spreading hate and intolerance on two continents. Clippings, memories, and stories hold a special place in Lillian Casey's heart. But so does the long-standing contributions about a man she knew as dad. To see that he had won the two consecutive derbies, uh, that was quite a something, especially since he was the last Afro-American jockey to win a derby. No more uh, Afro-American after him. He died and was buried in Maison Lafitte in 1974 at the age of 92. They were pushed from grace with the help of Jim Crow laws. This form of legal segregation not only split communities, but also cut deeply into the lucrative incomes of these once great champions. Black jockeys were sort of it, and they basically phased them out, and it was an economic thing. Heavier wagering, larger money pools, and fatter purses brought lucrative rewards for those who came home as winners. Financial growth in the sport fuels the arguments of economics. They phased them out for a number of reasons. They start making a lot of money. They start, remember, they, they were making almost three times as much money as just the average white working person around, you know, the 1870s, you know, 1880s. I mean, these guys were making lots and lots of money. You could not have former slaves winning all of this money and people be okay with that. But you still see that transition that continues into the 70s, the 80s, the 1890s. Those were really the great years, but in many ways that was the end of the period of dominance for African-American riders. When uh, Murphy won his last race um, in 1894, so uh, the purse was about $5,000, okay, and of course the, that was big money then, and he earned a considerable amount of money during that time. Uh, recently I was looking at uh, a clipping about his estate, and he left about $30,000 um, at the time of his death. Because of what was going on in the 1890s, there was an economic depression, which caused a lot of the major tracks to close down, uh, forcing um, greater competition between white jo jockeys and black jockeys. And um, so that was really the beginning of the end. I think that horse racing has always been a, uh, 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 you know, rich white man's sport. And it seems like that, uh, uh, that African Americans and, and women have just, uh, it really kind of been cut out of the loop. But it happened overnight. They stopped licensing them. And they made it very difficult to run. The, the white riders began ganging up on them, you know, along the rails. Uh, and it didn't take that long. In later years, there were the scandals in the New York area around 1910, 1912. And gradually, the black jockeys were were out of the out of the business. There was the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, um, who who absolutely started threatening black jockeys. Um, there was migration. The attraction of plentiful jobs in urban industrial centers lured many blacks away from their rural beginnings, shortchanging the sport a valuable talent back on the farm. One has to have access to um, horses um, and, and the, um, man, the extent to which African Americans have, are no longer present in rural settings in large numbers and no longer then have uh, access to growing up on family farms and being near uh, horses obviously contributes uh, to this dilemma as well. Jockey James Long also wonders why. He stays within the weight requirements, 
gets the needed experience and has brought some winners home along the way. Still, finding the right mounts is an ongoing challenge. You got to be at the right place at the right time, and majority of times when you're deer, you get overlooked by the more established jockeys. Physical conditioning is also part of this complex argument. Remember, you have to fit into a certain size, and uh, basically 110 pounds is what a jockey has to weigh to make the weight. Uh, African Americans, uh, whites, a lot of people are a lot bigger th than that. They can't be because uh, everybody has gotten tall and weighs too much to be able to do it. They've got to be young men who happen to be African American, who have the size and, and the what have you to be able to be jockeys. Something's keeping them out, it, you know? So I think um, the, the horse racing industry has to answer that question. Certainly they contributed so much to the early part of the game. Cot Campbell tries to answer. As owner of Aiken, South Carolina's Dogwood Stable, he's put thoroughbreds on tracks across America. Campbell offers this behind-the-scenes theory. Most of the workers on the racetrack at one time were African-Americans. Then you started seeing a lot of girls, and then you started seeing a lot of uh, Hispanics and mostly Mexicans. They were replaced by um, uh, a, a whole new genre of rider, uh, riders that were coming in from New York, coming up from Mexico. They, they just got kicked out. As the Depression years set in, in the 1890s, there's a man in New York, Mr. Daly, and he's training immigrant boys to ride. They are vicious. They are treated abusively because their livelihood literally depends on this. Questions have come in the headlines and through pointed illustrations and cartoons. Issues over their absence were discussed at a time when professional sports cope with another crossroads. And Jackie Robinson of the Dodgers. The, National League the black jockeys had practically all vanished by the time Major League Baseball gambled on this man who became a sports legend and national hero. When Jackie Robinson broke the color line in baseball in 1947, you know, there was a color line that had to be broken. Uh, with horse racing, because the jockeys were black, most of them, when it first started, when they, at least when the Kentucky Derby first started, there wasn't a color line to be crossed then. Now it's like retro. It's like now you have to recross the color line, almost. While strides have been made in other high-dollar areas of competition for decades, writer William C. Roden worries that what's happened in history and sports can repeat itself. To me, the most instructive lesson about, about the black jockey is not so much about the jockeys, but what it says about where things can go. And if I was an African-American basketball player, an African-American football player, I would really study the lessons. Here are the starters for the Warfield, number one is Loon. Marlon St. Julian is the rider. Marlon St. Julian is reclaiming and reliving thoroughbred racing's forgotten moments. They're trying to say that I'm one of the best um, African-American riders since the early 1900s. Um, I mean, I really don't want to be considered that. I want to be considered one of the best riders around, but I mean, it is an honor to, you know, to be considered in that category. At tracks in more than a half dozen states, he's burning up a once familiar pain. In the winner's circle for the featured eighth race, the inaugural running of the Warfield to number one loon, Gus Goldsmith, the owner. Scooter Dickey trains Marlon St. Julian rides this four-year-old gelded son of Woodman. Satisfying a personal desire comes by following his heart and chasing long-shot dreams. You know, I've had horses that were probable to run in the, in the derby, and, you know, we, we had a couple horses that, you know, ended up hurt, and, and one died. So, I mean, I'm just kind of sitting there waiting and maybe something to break by that time. Something did break by getting a mount in the 126th running of the Kentucky Derby. Marlon St. Julian getting a ride in the Kentucky Derby is just like Jackie Robinson going into baseball. It is that important. When, when you do see uh, a young brother who breaks through 
and gets them out, uh, gets them out on national television, gets them out in a prominent race, it's something to say, hey, you know, this is, this, is, this is a great thing. How did this young man get there? And I think it's important for people to realize the work that it takes to get to that level. I'm proud of him and a bit envious. So I, I think he's a nice guy. He deserved a shot just like anybody else. But uh, it's, it's every jockey's dream to get to that point where he's reached now. It is often described as the Super Bowl of horse racing. Below the hallowed twin spires of Churchill Downs, Derby Day 2000 brought an important flashback to the event's formative years. I mean, I'm very excited. It's kind of kind of an unexplainable feeling, you know. I, I'm like everyone says, I'm the first African American to ride the Kentucky Derby in 79 years. I mean, I think that's a good thing. But uh, to be able to participate in the most prestigious race in the country, I mean, it it's an unbelievable feeling. St. Julian's number two horse, Carul, started the day with 50 to 1 odds and finished seventh in a 19 horse field. Riding the Derby gave him a lot of publicity, you know, nationally wise, and uh, I think it made a, a big play. You know, it played a big role as far as my career. I mean, I, I've gotten several miles from a lot of good trainers that I hadn't ridden for before. The Derby gave him a springboard bounce to other turf classics like the Rich Breeders Cup and Saratoga's prestigious Traverse Stinks. But the ride for the Lafayette, Louisiana native hasn't always been smooth. I've never experienced personally a problem with someone maybe being prejudiced towards me because I was black. Um, I mean, a couple incidents came about, but sooner or later that person rode me. So it, it wasn't anything that I had to overcome. I mean, I, maybe it's just a blessing. You know, maybe I was put here to do this and to, to make a point. Making lasting points not only depends on solid skills, but also the right connections. He's got a lot of talent, uh, uh, a knack for getting the most out of a horse. And, and if he, uh, I think the big question is, will he be able to get good horses? That, that's the whole thing. Similar words are easily echoed by a well-known Hall of Fame trainer. He's got a great future. He's already established himself as a world-class rider, and all he needs to do is get uh, hooked down with a little bit uh, more uh, of the higher echelon stables, and he'll take off. He's very talented. He's special. And I, I really think he's a little superstar. St. Julian's agency's more than polished potential. Hall of Fame jockey and fellow Louisianian Randy Romero says this rider's many gifts reach beyond the rail. He's a great role model because uh, of his attitude and, he, and uh, the, the way that he can bring other young kids involved with being a jockey. Devotion to work is balanced with dedication to family. More than 10 years after his initial win came in at 17, he now has over a thousand first place finishes and purses exceeding five million dollars in 1999. A seam for Mighty sent through by St. Julian. And Mar Marlon St. Julian says his quest for success is beyond skin deep. I'm an African American, I'm black, I'm very proud to be that, but uh, when I leave the game, I want to leave the game with a lot of respect from people, and, and I, I really don't want to be known as just, you know, the best African American in the sport. I want to be known as one of the best riders in the sport. As the number of black riders quickly declined in the early 20th century, their valued skills we'll all right. were forced to the backside of the truck. Following their racing careers, many of them uh, were considered expert consultants on, on, on horses and uh, were able to generate some income uh, by consulting and, and giving advice about uh, certain mares and mounts and so on. They stayed right here and, and became trainers and, and worked, um, you know, in, in the stables and worked with the horses. So they quietly went about still staying close to what they love, but they weren't able to ride. William Walker, he starts out as a jockey. He gets too big to ride. He's a very successful trainer. They said that he could, from memory, recite the entire pedigree charts of the thoroughbred horse, and that goes back to about 1680. Black owners and trainers have also chased big dreams. Look 
consequence, that old devil consequence. Performer Eddie Rochester Anderson brought his three-year-old horse to the 1940 Kentucky Derby. Burnt Court came in 10th. Decades later, the biggest gathering in the bluegrass attracted other African Americans from the field of entertainment, hoping to find victory. Rap star Hammer and former Motown mogul Barry Gordy both had horses in separate derbies during the 1990s. Their entries came up short. One person used to own 40 horses. Now 40 people own one horse. It's a thrill. Uh, actually, I, I was fortunate that my first horse, a horse named Martial Law, went to Santa Anita Handicap. I was a partner in on that horse. California horse owner Wesley Burks is among those taking on the financial risk of group ownership. Originally from Louisville, he's a lifelong admirer of grace in motion. When I got into the sport, my my, uh, the, the reason I got in it was not for the financial reasons, but uh, because of the love for the, the sport itself and, and the animal. This man here, he was in the racehorse bid for 50 years. Carl Sitgraves came along as an owner and trainer in the 1930s, and in that decade, won races with Eddie Arcaro on board his horses. He was a big boy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been around all them boys. They was nice. They were nice. However, the conditions were sometimes mean. Rather than fight limited opportunities at one point, Carl Sitgraves, like Jimmy Winkfield, left the country to pursue his passion of racing. Yeah, I stayed in Mexico for about five years. His wife, Essie, was also a thoroughbred owner who stood by our man in the winter circle and through some of the not so glamorous tasks behind the scenes. And I used to work too, I, I worked on the racetrack. What'd you do? Clean stone, train if it's necessary, whatever come that I needed to do, I fill in. I had a job too. The late Oscar Dishman was a contemporary of Sid Graves and is an inspiration to current owner and trainer Larry Demerit. He feels an ongoing obligation to individuals who first opened the door. We hoping to take it to another level. They brought it so far and, and we so much appreciated of that. If we don't take it to the other level, then it's a disappointment. At Saratoga, part of their legacy is honored at the National Racing Hall of Fame. Jockeys Isaac Murphy and Willie Sims, along with trainers Ansel Williamson and Ed Brown, are all recognized for their early contributions. New lessons come in jockey trading cards, paying tribute to the sport's early pioneers, and a Wayne Barnett's 1985 Preakness ride. They also share the highlights of James Thornton's career. He died after a violent on-track spill and being trampled by a horse at Charlestown, West Virginia's Mountaineer Racecourse. Finding accurate numbers of active black riders is hard because the National Jockey Guild says it does not keep statistics relating to ethnic backgrounds of registered members. But it tracks around the country. Riders of African American descent have been reduced to scant single digits. In our community, uh, certainly being a jockey is not something that uh, is talked about around the dinner table. Uh, it is not talked about, it's not on the nightly sports news, and we don't see people like ourselves uh, in that sport. It is written about in two printed works by Lynn Renault, Racing Around Kentucky, and Jockey's Bells and Bluegrass Kings. I see them as people with a gift who were enabled to use that gift, and they've left us the legacy of that gift for the future. They leave hope that, hey, at once, once upon a time we was involved, and just hope that we can get re-involved. James Long gives us living proof of that hope. That's always been my challenge, to, to relive those times. I mean, it's, it's every jockey's dream, but it's more of a um, pursuit in my case. I mean, I'm more on a mission. A mission also shared and carried out by his ambitious colleague, Marlon St. Julian. 
Crossing the finish line for him not only inspires hope, but also serves as a reminder of a legacy lost and too often ignored. It's only been like a few years that I've been educating myself as far as that. I didn't really know when I first started in, in, in horse racing, um, I wasn't really familiar with the history of horse racing until a few years ago. And, and I, I mean, it just, it, it really amazes me, you know, and, and hopefully I can bring that back. Bringing it back will not come easy or overnight. While many of the pioneers of the sport did not live to see how the profession changed, make no mistake, many of the records first set by these jockeys have endured time's test. Through the struggles, they not only found success, but also made contributions of significance both on and off the track. I'm Steve Crump that's forgotten at the finish line. Thanks so much for joining us.